and to one of the most uh, sought after segments on the show where we get to speak to Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai, who is an infectious disease specialist, and also Dr. Newman Arthur, who is a clinical psychologist. They join me at this point. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me. Uh, good, good morning, Bella. I want to find out from both of you, any of you can go first. What do you think about the president lifting the lockdown? Well, I, I'll start with Dr. Bertha Sewai because you have been advocating, actually, for a national lockdown. And now we see the president lifting the lockdown. Are you disappointed? Um, I think the, the word that describes how I felt was nervous. Mm. Tell me why. Nervous. Why were you nervous? Because um, we were using the term science and data. Mm -hmm. And like, I like to quote scripture, I'm sorry, but you know, the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, our scientists have done a study that shows that the virus has not changed its character or quality. Mm -hmm. The president mentioned in his speech that we have been able to sequence the virus. It is the same one that went to China. It is the same one that was in Italy and all these places. It has not changed. And when it shows up in Ghana, it hasn't even changed. And so I feel like we're looking at our current science to make future decisions. But in COVID-19, you look at future science decisions to make your current um, I mean, you look at future projections to make your current decisions. Yeah. Ghana and most of Africa is exactly where Europe was on March 4th. You just go back and check. Mm. On March 4th, Europe had about 983 cases. Seven weeks later, there have over 1.2 million cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are also exactly where United States was on about March 16th or 15th. So America was lagging behind Europe by about 14 days. About March 14th, America recorded was about 283. And then I believe on March 17th, maybe we had a spike, but we went up to about 700. Now, this is exactly, March 14th is exactly five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. so five weeks later, America has gone from 283 to 800,000, okay, this yeah. is five weeks. What it means is that to look at your current data of 1,042 and say that because you are 1,042, you think you're okay and the virus will suddenly change, I will not, um, I cannot support that, not because of any personal reasons, but it's just science. I mean, we go to school to be objective. I mean, at some point, you have to be objective. What this virus does is, and, and it is why President Trump on one minute will be writing a letter to President Xi and saying, good job, good job, keep the virus in China. Because at that time, he didn't know that 283 cases on March 14th mm -hmm. is going to become 800,000 five weeks, five weeks later. And we're talking about just, today is April 20th. Yes. So I'm talking about... Exactly, set, no, well, 20 plus, 20, yeah, exactly 40 days later, America has recorded 800,000 mm -hmm. from 283. So you cannot look at 1,042 cases and say we're fine. No, the virus has not changed. If you give it the opportunity, you would hit 800,000. The only good thing I can say is that we're going a little above and beyond in terms of testing. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the lockdown, I always say, it's not a cure. The lockdown just gives you time so that it's like an army comes to you. You have an army of a 1,000 people. They all have swords and they're fighting. When you do a lockdown, it's like you are condoning maybe 900 of the army. You are tying their arms literally so they can move, mm -hmm. so that you fight the 100. And you're hoping that by the time you get rid of the 100, the 900 people are so weak, they can't fight, so you win the fight. The lockdown just does that, does just that. It doesn't suddenly kill all your thousand. So when you lift the lockdown and you say, okay, I'm still going to attack the 100, you've empowered the rest of the virus. What, what removing the lockdown literally means is that anybody who has been incubating the disease over the last 14 days, mm -hmm. they're going to start manifesting. We say they 
should come out and spread and go to our markets and do everything else. And so I think that we're entering a social experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we, we've done well. Let's put it objectively. Not many countries have gone on lockdown. It was Rwanda, Nigeria, yeah. South Africa, and a few. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is people haven't gone on lockdown because their numbers are 80. If you look around Africa, Egypt, um, um, South Africa South is Africa. around 3,000. Yeah. Algeria is around 1,200 or so. We are like number five. But what it means is, I keep saying this, you don't look at your current numbers. And we have too much history. We have China. We have Italy. We have America. You all saw what happened. And it doesn't take a year. Within six weeks, you would see. So I suppose, I mean, I'm not a... I'm not a decision maker. All I will say is this is an experiment. Let's see what's going to happen over the next six weeks. If the virus is truly going to behave like it did in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we are just seven weeks and five weeks behind the United States of America. What, which is why, yes, if you look at the current situation, it makes perfect sense. But if you look at what it does. You study countries, you study the projection, yeah. then you realize it's just like you have a hurricane coming. At the time you're going to make a decision, you don't have a hurricane, but you know it's going to come, so you prepare. But if you say that, well, mm. I don't feel any wind, yeah. I don't feel any strong anything. Besides, I don't even live near the coast. You can give all sorts of excuses. But yesterday I was watching CNN, one of the people in New York, I think it was one of the doctors, he said, look, this thing hit us fast and furious. When it hits, it will hit fast and furious. So for me as a scientist, I can only warn. I don't have okay. any um, ties or personal relationships to anybody. So I can give an objective analysis. And okay. that's just my thought. It makes All right. me nervous. Let, let me bring Dr. Newman in because at this point, it looks like people are a bit confused. As much as we're seeing numbers, uh, you know, scores of people out there going about their business, there's still a chunk of us that are confused. We don't know whether to step out, whether to stay in, because we're not sure what's going to happen. What do you make of that mental state that we find ourselves in? Dr. Newman, can you hear me? Dr. Newman? Okay, I'll come back to Dr. Bertha then, because, you know, you mentioned um, that, you know, the lockdown doesn't necessarily cure the, the problem. It only controls the spread. But testing is what really does the magic. And again, like uh, the president mentioned, we're the number one country in Africa that's done more tests per million. And so then if we're releasing people to go out there and contact tracing is still ongoing actively, then that should still give us the results that we require without necessarily spreading it. No? Um, not exactly. See, if you look uh, at the data that you, um, you presented oh. earlier. Dr. Newman, I'll um, come to you shortly. The, enhanced, the okay. enhanced surveillance did pick up a number of people. I think it was maybe, is it 1.2% or whatever that number yes. was. Now, the enhanced surveillance was testing the contacts of the contacts. Now, our routine surveillance also picked up some people. So, the point is that when you do a lockdown, you're almost, like I said, holding the army down while you gain control of the ones that are out there in the loose. And okay. I understand. I'm sure the decision was based on people live on a daily income. They mm -hmm. shop on a daily basis. Yeah. It's hard to get them food. And I'm sure even based on the government budget, it was hard to probably meet all the food promises and the pressure, mm -hmm. pressure. People don't have money. How are they going to pay this? How are they going? So, I mean, I can understand the difficulty the administration must be in, especially when you haven't hit that peak, that, you know what, you have to make some kind of a, a and it's the same pressure everybody's facing everywhere. America, Europe, they're all under pressure. I mean, one minute Donald Trump says, you know what, I think I'm going we're going to open my yeah. and, and then the scientists will tell him, you don't make that decision. The virus will tell you when you can... Um, the good thing about UK is that at least um, the prime minister had to be ill. Mm -hmm. And now you can see that they're extending their lockdown because he's felt it in his body. And sometimes we say, oh, only nine people have died. Well, only nine is 0.86%. It comes down to the 1% we know everywhere. So even our number of deaths, it still confirms the fact that this virus is the same everywhere. It doesn't
doesn't mm. make ours any different. Okay. And sometimes when you look at the individual numbers, it can deceive you. When those nine people include the rector of your college of physicians, mm. in Nigeria, it was a right-hand man of the of president. The president yeah. in, in Iran, it's a right-hand man of Ayatollah. It makes you put it into perspective. Okay, let, let, me, let me come back to Dr. Newman to answer the question about the mental state that people find themselves in. Because like I said, as much as we have many people out there, yeah. there are still people who are confused. Some don't even know whether to go to work or not because they are not sure if they are safe. Others are not sure if they can step out and go about their normal duties, even though the president has eased the restrictions. What do you make of it? Yeah, I think that generally uh, when people see that there's an improvement in the situation, and there's, there's a, a relief of lockdown, then they, they will become a bit uh, uh, positive about uh, what, what is going on. But now we know it's jumped to 1,042. Then there is a lift of lockdown. So people actually are anxious about what to do and whether they should, they should stay home or they should go to work. Or so This one, someone called me and was saying that he's scared to step out because it's now 1,042. When it was around in, in, the, in the tents, we, we, we locked down. Now it's in the thousands, and we, we're hoping <laughs> we said mm -hmm. everybody could go out. So people are actually anxious, and they don't even know what to do again. Because someone called me this morning and said he's, he's anxious, he's afraid to step out. He doesn't know what to do, right? And also, if you look at the response of people to the lift of lockdown, <laughs> you see people were jumping in town, going about all kinds of things in town. So it's like now people are even the precaution uh, that the precautions that were put there for people to follow, it is not like that anymore. Because it's actually very difficult to control human behavior. Mm. One of the most uh, difficult things to control is human behavior, especially in, in a diverse society where people do what they like. You know, it, it is very, very difficult. Look at even common malaria, we still struggle with common malaria. Now, I know in the northern region, you know, TSM uh, has gone up. It's also, you know, yeah, and, and, in the upper west, people are yeah. Dying. Mm. You know, all kinds of things. Cholera, even at this point, we still struggle with con uh, containing cholera and controlling cholera. It's human behavior. So the lockdown is meant to put all of us in check so that people don't do what they like, especially in this season. So okay. if we all saw the numbers coming down and there was a lift of lockdown, then people will be quite happy that at least we've seen progress and this has become necessary. But okay. if we are going up and we have to, we have to lift it, then people will be scared. Actually, but, but, I, I, I was a bit anxious yesterday. What, what happens to employers? Um, so if I work for someone, as an employer, I mean, I'm talking about the other person, as an employer, what are they supposed to do yes. to ensure my safety? Because I can decide not to go to work if I'm not convinced that the working environment is safe. And I believe that I have every... Uh, right, maybe I'm not sure legal, but every other right to ensure that my safety comes first as well. Uh, well, at, at this point, every every uh, employer will be, will be concerned because, for example, if you work in a certain environment, you have about uh, 500 people, 200 people, or 100 people, or even 50 people coming to work every day. You are going to be concerned because one person who may have it spends the whole day with everybody else in one office. The likelihood that they're going to spread it is very high. So employers are going to be worried. You know, there was an incident where a, a, a company had one person test positive and the person had been to work for a day or two and everybody was panicking. And even mm. the workers were really angry that uh, uh, something like that could happen. So there will be anger, there will be confusion. People will be very, very anxious. When people come to work, they don't even know who to, who to be around with and that kind of thing. This is going to be the actual situation at, in a working environment. Mm -hmm. And if an employee says, I will not come to work because I want to be safe, how do you sack that employee? So very, very difficult. So what okay. I would advise is that the general precautionary, uh, the precautionary measures, we should keep you know, putting those things in place. And let's trust and hope that this decision, this decision will turn out to be a good one. Okay, Dr. Bertha, 99 people have recovered currently in Ghana. The question that's lingering in the minds of people. So, I mean, of course, like you have explained to us, the virus doesn't entirely leave the body. It just becomes very dormant because your immune system is able to fight it. But what, what are some of the things that could lead to a recovered patient contracting the virus again or having the virus resurface um, in his body or her body? Um, I don't think it will be a new contracting of the virus versus 
it expressing itself in an area where a swab or a culture would show it positive. Mm. Um, and there's a lot we have to learn about this virus because um, the learning from Ebola, I mean, it even continues at this point. They're still tracking patients with Ebola to detect which tissues have it, which tissues don't have it. Even the antibodies, as of this time, the whole world, scientific world, doesn't know what those antibodies mean. Does that mean the person would never get it again? Does that mean next year, if this virus would come back in the same full force, those who were infected would not will be able to survive it? We mm. really do not know. And that's just the truth of it. We don't know what that antibody is. It, is it an immunity? Mm. Because, you know, there are viruses where you get it once and you never get it again. You know, like chicken pox and measles. You're never going to get it again. Okay. And then there are others like norovirus where you can get it 20 times. Mm. You don't build any immunity. Any antibody doesn't mean anything. Um, even HIV. There are people who will test positive for HIV. They're taking medications and they keep having relationships with other people. They can acquire new viruses. And if you do the genetic profile, you can see they've acquired a resistant virus from somebody. So at this point, we all don't even know what those antibodies mean, whether it's immunity, whether it's just a transient um, serology or what. Even patients with hepatitis C, after they get cured, they can acquire a new infection if they go and inject drugs again. So um, that's just my take on that. Okay. Now, the conditions set by the WHO, there are six of them, and those are the conditions that countries and heads of states should consider before lifting a lockdown or easing the restrictions in their various countries. I I'm sure that you've been able to go through it, but just in case you haven't, disease transmission under control, health systems should be able to detect, test, isolate, and treat every case and trace every contact. Hotspot risk should be minimized in vulnerable places such as nursing homes, etc. Schools, workplaces, and other essential places should have established preventive measures. The risk of important new cases should be able to be managed and communities uh, should be fully educated, engaged, and empowered to live under a new normal. I'll come to you, Dr. Betha, but first of all, Dr. Numian, have we been able to meet these conditions um, in, in your opinion? Yeah, I think some of them. Uh, I think there's pointer two and three, or, or the testing and all that. Mm -hmm. But the, I think the last part about education and all that, I exactly. think that we, we're still, there, there's still a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do in that area. Because how can people be jubilating and running you know, on the streets last night? <laughs> it shows they don't really understand what yeah. is going on. So I think that bit, and at this point, that is the only thing we have now, <laughs> to educate them and to hope that they will do the right thing, mm. you know. And okay. so that, that, is, that is what, because now it's like everybody is on, on their own and what they do matters. And it will be dependent on the kind of information they have and their, com their commitment to making sure that whatever information they get, they put it to use. Okay. And so uh, that bit is, is what, what, what we are left with eventually uh, mm. now. Okay, Dr. Bertha, what, do you share the same sentiments? Well, I think that number four and five, we've got to down pat, which mm. is um, importation of cases that we took care of it. Um, yeah. We took care of it um, in the middle of March. And in terms of churches, schools, schools, workplaces, schools yeah. and churches are out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so we pretty much know that we've taken care of four and five. Mm. Number five, we barely scratched the surface. I was happy when last week the Minister of Information was talking about how during the live um, Ministry of Information briefing, they brought in the journalists, the media houses, telling everybody to spend more time on COVID-19. They've engaged the Department of Linguistics at Ligon so that more pamphlets. I think we barely, so far as the English, people who can understand English is, are concerned, I think we've done a good work. Most people get it. But those people who we really want the message to get to the fishermen, the people who are selling in the market, who don't even watch radio, can't understand what we say, we barely scratch the surface. Because if you interview them, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, people are still extremely misinformed. And if we could do like a strong two week target, 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 and actually get feedback that shows that people, because when, when, when the WHO visited China, what they found amazing was they saw people behind their windows. They were standing there. They were looking, but they were not stepping out. 
it means you have a very highly disciplined people. I don't think where because they understood what was going on. Mm. We don't understand it. Like Florida, they said the beaches are open. That's like craziness in the middle of an outbreak. The beaches are open. I mean, yeah. clearly there's something, there's some mismatch. So until we could get the message to them, then we can do that decision of, we, we, we haven't met number five. That's number six. That's for sure. Yeah. Number one, two, and three is debatable. Are mm. we, are, do we have the capacity to pick every new case? I think we the, the, the new um, app that we launched is mm. useful. It's picking up symptoms. Okay. But until, you know, in, in Taiwan and Singapore, they had the software that was tracking like everybody and they were picking even Singapore two days ago, mm. they suddenly had a set spite of all their software. So we have to be extremely careful. I think we've met four and five, one, two, three, and six. We haven't completely done that. Okay. I still applaud the expanded testing, though. All right. Thank you so much. And again, for those of you who um, wanted some clar clarification, pardon me, on how you can also support uh, the Africa CDC in, with some PPEs, like Dr. Bertha said. Uh, so they can send you an email, right, Dr. Bertha? Yes. Okay, so it's sewabb at gmail.com. Yes. Okay, so all designers who are interested in sewing some PPEs that can be purchased by the Africa Center for Disease Control to support health workers all across the continent, you can send Dr. Bertha Sewa a mail. And if you want the exact spelling, you can check my Instagram page. I posted that over the weekend, and so you can grab the email address and send to it. Thank you so much. Dr. Bertha Sewa, i.e., is an infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist. And we're looking forward to spending the rest of the week with both of you on air. And so we'll see you tomorrow, God willing. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too.